All right, welcome to Fabrication 101. Uh, we're back in the garage, obviously we're here. Uh, we're gonna do some TIG welding. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about TIG welding. Today I'm gonna put my, my teacher hat on a little bit uh, and go over some of the, like the five or six common uh, mistakes I see my beginning TIG welding students uh, making and maybe it'll help some of you guys out. So let's get into it. You ready? If you're new to the channel, you may not know that I've talked about the fact that I'm a welding instructor. I've been teaching for about 15 years uh, to both high school and college welding students. Uh, and when it comes to TIG welding, there's a lot of kind of, some of these are real common mistakes uh, that I see a lot of my students make. Uh, and then some of these are kind of weird little uh, fluke things that I've found. Uh, and with the, the cost of a pretty decent little TIG welder dropping considerably in the last few years. Uh, there's a lot more people that are picking up a TIG torch for the first time uh, and trying to you know make their hand at it. And so I thought uh, I'd do a little video here on some of the, the some of the common uh, beginning mistakes I see with my students, and they kind of break into two categories. Uh, one is setup, uh, and the other one is going to be technique issues, and so. Uh, we're gonna start with our setup stuff and then we're gonna lead into our technique. Uh, and so the first one, uh, first one is how we put together our torch. So the first main piece of our piece of equipment is our torch. Uh, there's lots of different styles of these, uh, but they all kind of have the same basic setup, whether it's uh, a water-cooled or an air-cooled torch. Uh, the next piece that comes into this is either gonna be your gas diffuser, uh, and this one here is a uh, an air-cooled gas diffuser or a gas lens. And I'm a big fan of gas lenses. The first thing you need to do is make sure you get your torch assembled correctly. And this is one where I've had kind of a weird issue in the past. Uh, we have our, our, our gas lens our collet, or our gas diffuser. We have our collet, uh, which is what holds our tungsten. Uh, and we can either, again, we can have the collet that goes with uh, our, our gas, dif gas diffuser or collet body. Uh, or we can have the collet that goes with our gas lens. Uh, so notice it's a little shorter. Uh, that's because this happens to be a, a stubby gas lens kit from, uh, what's his name, Weldmonger. But anyway, one of the weird issues I found a couple years ago with some of my students uh, was that they were taking their torch uh, and they were putting the back cap in first, uh, which wouldn't seem like it's too much of an issue, but what I found, and I don't know if you guys can see it down in there, what I found is that when they threaded the back cap in, uh, they would thread it all the way into the torch, and they would go in so all the way in, and then they would go to put their gas diffuser or gas lens in, uh, but what you, what I don't know if you can see down in there, let me turn my light on, maybe we can see down in there, um, the back cap goes in so far uh, that it actually closes off the hole where the gas comes into the torch. Uh, so my suggestion has always been to take uh, and put your put this piece in first, whether it's a gas lens uh, or a gas diffuser, call it body. Um, you need to make sure it goes in uh, and you need to make sure it's in there snug. You don't need to uh, grab a a pipe wrench and a cheater bar to put these in, but you do want to make sure that they're not loose. Anytime you have a loose connection in an electrical system, you're going to run into issues. The next thing that goes in here is going to be your, your collet, and there's a couple different styles of these. This is, these happen to be a split collet. This tapered end goes into the torch, and I have a lot of students mess this part up where they, they put the, the collet in backwards, 
uh, and it damages the collet, kind of ruins it, uh, but it doesn't hold your tungsten in place. Uh, another really common problem I've seen uh, is where they get everything assembled and their tungsten does not stay in there and they have their back cap screwed all the way in, it's super tight, um, and it's because they don't have their gas lens or collet body all the way in. Uh, it's partially in uh, and it's not seated completely and so what happens is your, your collet doesn't get pushed all the way into the collet body to hold it in place. And so you wanna make sure that this thing is threaded all the way in. And then we can put our, our collet in uh, in the back of the torch and then we can put our gas our back cap on uh, we don't want to run it all we don't want to run this back cap all the way in uh, because it will collapse our collet uh, and then we'll have to go put a new one in there so once we find our piece of tungsten this is a nice little short one that i was using a little earlier but uh, it slides in there uh, and then we can snug down our back cap and make sure everything's held in place and so it shouldn't move it and you should not have to really crank on these things to hold them into place uh, the next part of this, whether you're using this style or a gas lens, uh, is you got to put a nozzle on there. Um, so the nozzles thread on, and again, you want to make sure that these uh, are threaded in uh, nice and snug. You don't really have to crank on them. Uh, you don't have to get crazy with them, but that, we want to make sure that they're in there nice and snug. Now, you see how that tungsten slides in and out nice and easy? Uh, we shouldn't have to fight it. Um, you pull it out so you can clean it up, sharpen it, uh, or adjust it. Now, when it comes to stick out on your tungsten, um, I find that as long as you're within, uh, even with the gas lens, you don't wanna be out further than the diameter of your nozzle. Um, usually, especially if it's not a gas lens, if it's just a regular gas diffuser type, uh, I tell my students about uh, half to three quarters of our noz nozzle diameter in our stick out. Uh, and you can get away with a little bit more, especially depending on your weld joint design. Um, but that's kind of the benefit of these gas lenses is you can actually have a little bit more stick out uh, and still have good gas coverage over uh, your tungsten. So now that we've got our torch assembled properly or mostly assembled properly, um, the next step is gonna be how you adjust your machine. Uh, one kind of a weird, you wouldn't think this would be a problem was too much gas flow. Uh, so we, we turn on our gas bottle, um, we set our flow regulator, our flow, flow regulator, our flow meter um, to our settings and a, a good kind of general range is going to be somewhere between 10 and 25 CFH, that's cubic feet per hour. If you're using a normal nozzle, uh, what happens is as you're welding that gas, uh, you get turbulence that comes out from the gas flow and the gas starts to roll. Uh, and it actually will suck in atmosphere uh, and contaminate your weld puddle. Uh, I'm typically about 20 CFH and I feel like that works pretty well for most of what I do. So the next thing that I see often uh, is when they set their amperage on their machine, they set it way too high. The closer you set your machine to where you wanna be welding, the finer the control is gonna be in this foot pedal or in your thumb switch or whatever you're using. So that's why it's important to try to set your machine relatively close to where you wanna weld so that you have the ability to kind of fine tune what you're doing with your foot pedal. Uh, I personally, my preference, uh, I usually set my machine within 10 or 15, maybe even 20 amps of what I wanna be at above, I guess you should say 10 to 15 amps above uh, and what I like to do when I weld is I'll go full pedal uh, till I get my puddle established and then I let off. And then I'm usually running uh, about three quarters pedal. Uh, if I feel like I'm not using enough of the pedal, I can actually turn the machine down uh, and then it gives me a little bit more finite control over what I'm doing with this torch. Uh, and so that's why I think it's important not to not to set these machines way too high. Yes, you can do that. You could set the machine at its max uh, and then just use just a little bit of it, uh, but you have a lot more control uh, if you set it close. All right, the next thing I wanna talk about is something that everybody does but nobody wants to admit is that's dipping your tungsten or fouling your tungsten. It happens. You kind of have to accept it. Even the, the, best, the baddest welder on Instagram, I guarantee you, fouls his tungsten every now and again and probably did it 
a whole lot when he was first learning. The thing is, you, you don't want to just continue welding. You need to stop. You need to take the time to clean that tungsten. And I'm not going to tell you how to clean it. There's lots of different ways to do it. You can use a fancy tungsten grinder. Uh, you can use your bench grinder as long as you use kind of a dedicated wheel. So there's lots of ways to do it. Uh, make sure that you do it the right way, uh, but take the time to sharpen your tungsten. Can you weld with a fouled tungsten? Absolutely. Is it going to look like crap? Most likely. Uh, I kind of equate it to like trying to uh, write with a dull pencil or a broken pencil. Yeah, you can kind of do it, but it doesn't look very good. Uh, so take the time to sharpen your tungsten. If you're going to be away from a tungsten grader, sharpen multiple tungstens. Uh, and have them in your booth or wherever you're working or next to your machine. But take the time to sharpen your tungsten. It's gonna improve your welds. Uh, it's gonna make a difference if you keep a sharp tungsten on your machine. All right, now I wanna get into some technique issues. And uh, some of these are gonna be how you hold your torch, how you hold your filler metal, uh, and what angles you're bringing your torch in at. And all of these are super important things uh, and make a huge difference uh, and what in the results, the quality of the welds that you're going to get. Uh, so the first one, let's talk about torch angle. Uh, with TIG welding, we are pushing our weld puddle. Yes, there are going to be times where you might drag a little bit, primarily by and large, for the most part, any other ways I could say that, uh, we want to be pushing our weld puddle. Uh, so again, our, our work angle, which is our angle that of our electrode perpendicular to our direction of travel, uh, is 90 degrees if we're in a regular flat position weld like this. Our travel angle, which is the angle that's the same as or parallel to our direction of travel, okay, um, usually is going to be somewhere between uh, 10 and 15 degrees. So that, that 10, 10 to 15 degrees uh, is our normal kind of standard push angle. And again, there are, there's always going to be exceptions to these things. But this is by, for the most part, this is what you want to be shooting for. Uh, if you need a visual reference for 10 to 15 degrees, uh, if you think about an analog clock, a normal clock face, one minute on a clock is six degrees. So uh, 10 to 15 degrees uh, is like one to two minutes. So two minutes on a clock would be 12 degrees. Uh, so if you can go, you can go one, two-ish, so there's your 10 to 15 degree push angle right there. So here's a little visual I like to do with my high school students with a flashlight. You can see the shape of my, the light beam that's coming out of there. If I change my angle, uh, you can see how that, the shape of that, the light changes. The same thing happens to your arc and your weld puddle that comes out of a TIG torch. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you keep your angle the same the whole way through your travel, uh, but also, uh, in addition to our angle comes in our distance. Uh, so a common problem I see with my students is they'll start out at a really good distance uh, and as they go, they start to lift up uh, and they get further away or they start out too far away to begin with. All right, so now you've got your torch angle proper. Uh, now it's time to start adding some filler material to your weld. One of the things I see very commonly with my students is that as they start, they, they start down nice and close, they get their puddle going, uh, and then they go to bring their filler in, and as, as their filler gets close, they lift their torch. Two things happen, their puddle solidifies because it cools down, uh, or their arc cone, because there is a, a cone shape that comes out of this, gets so big uh, that it makes the puddle wider and flatter and really changes the shape of the weld. You wanna maintain your arc length as best you can, uh, and again, just like I showed with that flashlight, Right there welding and you start picking your torch up, your puddle is going to get bigger and bigger. Same thing if you get too close, it's going to get smaller and smaller. All right, another common problem that goes along with your torch angle uh, is how you position your hands or stabilize yourself. Uh, we definitely don't want to be trying to float up in the air. It makes it super difficult to maintain your arc length. Uh, so we definitely want to be propping ourselves on something. Uh, now, if you're going to prop on your hand, which is probably where you're the most stable, uh, you want to be able to slide your hand along the weld, nice and smooth. One of the things I get a lot with my students is that they, they kind of pin themselves. So they'll start, they'll get to a point, and then they'll start rotating instead of sliding. 
And that rotation, if you're if you find your welds are going in a you're you're not welding straight, your weld goes along for a while, then all of a sudden it curves off. That's because of that. You're pinning your hand at some point in your weld. You're moving along and you're stopping, and then you're trying to push it with your fingers uh, and try to maintain that with your hand. Now you can do that for short welds, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, but if you're trying to do a longer weld, you need to be able to position yourself and keep your slide along the weld. With heat is don't be afraid of it. I find a lot of my students, they're afraid of the heat. Uh, they're afraid to put heat into the plate. They're afraid of overheating the metal. Uh, sometimes I find that they run at such a low amperage, they're putting so much heat into their material that they're warping it. Sometimes it's better to weld hot and move fast uh, than it is to weld cold and go really slow. All right, so there you go. There's some of my common mistakes that I find my students making. My, I think five or six, maybe seven. I don't remember. I lost count. I don't math good. So I hope that helps some of you guys with some of your TIG welding issues that you might be having. If you're having some other weird ones, uh, maybe leave them in the comment section below. Maybe I might have a, uh, a solution for you. I find a lot of what I do as a welding instructor is troubleshooting uh, what my students are doing. Uh, so that's going to do it for this video. I appreciate you guys tuning in. If you, appreciate, if, you, if you like this video, if you're liking this content, make sure you give me a thumbs up. Subscribe if you haven't done, done so already. Uh, and feel free to share this video with a friend. Uh, again, thank you guys for tuning in to Fabrication 101, and we will see you in the next episode. In the meantime, you know the words. Do me a favor, do yourself a favor, and go build something. I'm going to go build something. That's what I do here. <laughs>